Hey, good morning, everyone. How are you today? My name is Ben, and uh, I've got some friends with me. We were here last week, too. We're from a, a new church plant on the other side of the county uh, in, in uh, Paso Robles. And so this is uh, part of our worship team. And uh, Pastor Nate asked if we come up and, and help you out because your worship leader has other things on his mind, I hear. Um, but this is my uh, daughter, Mia. This is Wayne. This is Josh. This is Brett. So would you stand with us and let's spend some time in worship? All right, let's clap together. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Calvary. I'm Dominic, and I'm one of the elders here at CBC. And I thank you for joining us in worship today, whether here in house or those of you online. And if you would, those of you here in the house would fill out that uh, Connect card and tear it off your bulletin and put it in the uh, offering plate that will be coming around shortly. We'd appreciate it. Communicate with us in that way. Again, welcome. 
worship team from Mavericks in Paso. We appreciate them being here. Yes. It's great when we can share our gifts with one another in worship, and we appreciate it very much. Pastor Nate is back, and he is bringing us his uh, word from Acts chapter 5. Again, welcome home, Marshes. Hope your trip was uh, pleasant and not too hot. Yeah, we live in a, a spoiling environment here, so thank God. Blaise Pascal wrote in one of his books, I set it down as a fact that if all men knew what each said of the other, there would not be four friends in the world. The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Let's pray. Father, you are good to us. You are gracious and merciful. You want us to grow up and image Christ in each of our lives. And as you bring us along in our stories, we pray that our hearts will be bent towards that, towards your will, creating Christ in me and Christ in us. Part of that is being honest with each other and with you. And Pastor Nate will be talking about that today. Thank you that we can be honest with you. You know us deeply through and through, and we can't hide or deny what you know of us. And yet you love us in spite of ourselves and in spite of how we are. Change us. Give us new hearts. Thank you for this day that we can hear from you through Pastor Nate and the music. We pray that this offering that we collect will go to minister here locally and around the world. Thank you for this generous church that your work here continues. And we thank you in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Okay. A couple of announcements to highlight. I was told one of the most important is after the service, there is a bake sale out in the foyer. So uh, there may not be cookies on the cookie cart, but there are going to be goodies out there. This is for the high school uh, and their uh, summer uh, camp. Two more Fridays left for Old Town Market, and I hear it's going pretty well. If you have heard also and want to participate in the next two Fridays, please see Tonya Edwards. And Tonya, would you raise your hand if you want to stand up? So those people who, there you go, good morning. Okay, please see her. Uh, again, a couple of items in the bulletin to pay attention to. Uh, Tuesday morning, there is a Bible study for the women. Uh, today, there is the prayer meeting uh, at 3. And in August, there's uh, what's labeled a woman's event. I think it's just another idea for women to get together, chat, eat, and uh, have fun, which is okay. All right. Uh, just a meal again, July twenty third, and the uh, summer camp fundraiser is finishing up. So when they uh, approach you with those yellow tickets, uh, that's great. Uh, but also buy some goodies after. Back of the schedule, a bulletin is our weekly schedule. Please uh, pay attention to some of those items. 
And last but not least, I see we have a new couple here amongst us. Welcome, Mr. and Mrs. Daniel Fratz. I hope your trip went well and you didn't lose your luggage. All right, good. And with that, would you please stand, greet one another? Thank you. Let's spend some time in worship together. We're so glad you're here. Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry? Then from north to south and east to west, we'd hear Christ. Be magnified Were the whole earth Echoing his eminence His name would Burst from sea and sky From rivers to The mountain tops We'd hear Christ Magnified. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. In me, and every creature finds its inmost melody, and every human heart and state of Christ. Oh, then in one enraptured hymn of praise. In Christ be magnified, be magnified. Whoa, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar. I won't bow, I won't bow to idols, I stand strong to worship you, and if it puts me in the fire, 
I'll rejoice cause you're there too And I won't be for my feelings I hold fast to what is true If the cross brings transformation I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just a doorway Into resurrection life And if I join you in your suffering Then I'll join you when you rise When you return in glory With all the angels and the saints My heart will still be singing And my song will be the same
we thank you this morning for your goodness to us. Undeserved goodness, undeserved favor. God, as we worship you today, would you remind us of who you are? If we're struggling to remember that you're good, would you help us just to do that today? And despite what we're going through this morning, Lord, we, we just give it all to you. And we worship you anyway. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for driving down early and worshiping with us, leading us to our Lord. Appreciate, appreciate you guys. Well, hey, Calvary. <laughs> I changed it up a little bit on you. Well, I want to invite our youth who are going to summer camp up to the stage because we're going to pray with them this next Sunday. They're going to be traveling. They're going to arrive here early in the morning, and um, they're going to head on out. So uh, I'm going to have them come up, and we're going to pray over them. And this is the last Sunday, as was mentioned, uh, for fundraising and, and that kind of thing, and which is why they're doing the bake sale. They've really put a lot of effort into fundraising, and they've done a really good job. Over half of their camp has been paid for by fundraising so far, and I'm not sure what the final numbers are going to look like. But these guys have put in a lot of work with that. And so I uh, want to acknowledge that. Um, but yeah, ask God that he would really bless y'all's time, that y'all could really connect with him over summer camp and have a little bit of fun too. <laughs> but it is fun to connect with God when you feel his presence and know that he is leading and guiding your life. So let's pray for that end. And yeah, we'll ask for God's protection too because we want you guys to come back all in one piece too. Let's pray. Well, Father, thank you so much for our youth, and thank you uh, for their love for you and their desire to go to summer camp. Pray your blessing upon that. Uh, Lord, that you would help them finish off this fundraising stuff, and uh, Lord, that you would bless all their efforts in trying to raise this money, but Lord, that their camp experience would be focused around you. Uh, Lord, that they would feel your presence, that they would know you speaking into their lives to transform their hearts, to be closer to you and like your son Jesus. And so we ask for that. We ask that they would have fun, that they would enjoy each other and have a, a good trip there and back. Keep them safe. And Lord, bring them back on fire to make you known to their friends. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. We've been in a sermon series called This is the Way. And we've been looking at the first church, and that church uh, was a, a really large church. It was 5,000 men. That's not including the women and the children. But the Spirit was directing this church and the apostles to proclaim and verify Jesus' authority. And it, it, God was working so powerfully through this group that it caught the attention of the religious rulers. And they wanted to stop this group. They wanted this group to not have as much influence as they were having. And every attempt that the religious rulers made to try to stop the apostles' teaching and, and this group, the more God's intervention displayed the authority of Jesus and magnified the message of salvation in his name. Now, with any group of people... There are threats to that group's health and prosperity. And so groups, in order to fight against that, they have to constantly be thinking about the things that bring them together and create unity with that group. Our unity as a church is from our love of Jesus and that he has given us this hope and this future. And so we are unified as we pursue this deeper relationship with Jesus together and, and bring others alongside with us. And so we phrase it here at Calvary that we've been revived in order to reveal that Jesus has actually changed our life and, and given us this new life. And it's not just for us to hold on to and enjoy for ourselves. It's for us to be able to give to others, to reveal to them that hope that we have and invite them to join us in this pursuit of God. Now, there are threats to our unity as followers, and one of the big threats that we face is sometimes uh, in following Jesus, we don't always want to do what Jesus tells us to do. 
And it happens to me too, where I'm like, Jesus, do you really want me to do that? And it doesn't work well for the unity of following Jesus if for some reason we pick and choose the things that we follow Jesus in and then the things that we don't want to follow Jesus in. Well, right after Natalie and I were married, we moved to Dallas, Texas. And it was quite the task because I grew up in Virginia, and so we had to get all my stuff to Texas. And Natalie grew up in California, in Bakersfield. We had to get all her stuff to Texas. And as we were taking my stuff in my parents' truck from Virginia to Dallas, um, I noticed the truck was having brake issues. I'd press on the brake, and it would veer to the left, and so I'd have to steer to the right to correct it. And as we got to Memphis, Tennessee, I was like, man, this is getting bad. I'm kind of a, a little bit scared that my brakes could fail. And so we, we pulled over, and we found a, a mechanic uh, from Goodyear. The problem was this mechanic was quite the schemer. And see, uh, he was asking me about the truck and asking me about some mechanical stuff. He was trying to check my mechanical knowledge to see what he can get away with. And so I have to say, I was only a recent grad at the time, and I had forgotten the lessons that my dad had diligently taught me about fixing the cars. My dad would really want you to know that he wasn't negligent in his responsibilities of teaching me. But the mechanic decided to take advantage of my ignorance. And it was an issue of the brake lines. The, the lines themselves had began to deteriorate. And so once the brake system was flushed and new hoses were installed, everything was fine. It worked fine. And it shouldn't have cost more than like $300 max. Remember, this is like 20 years ago, okay? It was $900. And so, kids, where are you guys? If your parents are teaching you some like life skills and stuff, pay attention, set down the video games, because the reality is you need to absorb those skills and lessons because there will be a test later in life. <laughs> and in this case, as is the case in other times, some people are willing to deceive for their own advantage. And we're going to see that in our passage today. The problem, though, is the deception happens within the church. And so it's a threat to the gathering's unity. Now, when we look at our passage, we'll see that nearly every vantage point but God's looks extreme, looks authoritarian. But go ahead and turn to Acts 5 this morning. I need to set up some things with our, our passage. Uh, Acts 5 comes on the heels of really the height of the church's unity because they're praying and God was shaking their like meeting house because of the power of his pleasure at their prayers. And the spirit of God is giving them boldness to proclaim Jesus as the true king of everyone. In fact, followers are so overwhelmed by the provision that God is giving to them, that some of them were selling their extra property and like second homes and giving all of that money to the gathering to help those that were needy. And so uh, let's look at that real quick. And you don't need to turn there. Just listen as I uh, read this out to you. This is from chapter 4, verse 34. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned lands and houses sold them brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So this section kind of introduces Barnabas, who will have more of a role in Acts later on, but because of the commitment of this group and the unity that they had in their mission of proclaiming Jesus, this church was growing. They were seeing God respond to their prayers. When we come to our passage, things are a little bit different. If you don't have a Bible this morning, you can grab one from the pew rack, and we're on page 1023 of that Bible. And let's look at chapter 5. Because like I said, this is a similar scenario where a wealthy couple is going to give this very generous gift to the church for the purpose of helping the needy. The problem is they lie about it. So follow along with me as we start in chapter 5, verse 1. 
Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself and brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And a great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young men came forward and wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. Now, I want to clarify what's going on here because Ananias and Sapphira, they sell a, a piece of their land or, or extra land that they had. They brought the money. Um, they kept a portion of it to themselves, and they gave the other portion to the church. The problem was they said that the portion they gave to the church was the sale price. And that was not true. Now, the church had no like, right to any of that money, and that's what Peter is saying when he's confronting Ananias here. It was very generous for Ananias and Sapphira to give any uh, amount of this sale to the church. This was not an obligation that they had. This was not part of their tithes or, or offerings or, or things like that. This was above and beyond. And what was happening as a church that, that we saw before is that the wealthy were choosing to sell land and giving all of that money so that the needy could be taken care of in the church. And it seems like Ananias and Sapphira, they want to be part of that elite group, if you will, and give like Barnabas and some of these others. But instead of giving the full amount, they keep some for themselves, and they say the portion that they give was the total full amount. See, if you were to give like 1% of money from a sale of property that you had and gave that to the church, that would be an amazingly generous gift. I don't know what the portion of uh, this amount that they gave, even if it's like 60%, like that is a gigantic financial gift to the church. The issue here is actually not about the money. And most financial issues with God, it's not about the money. The problem was Ananias and Sapphira lied. And Peter said, look, you had every right to do whatever you wanted with that money. God wasn't envious about their funds. Ananias and Sapphira, they want this like recognition and accolades. They want to look good in the eyes of others. And isn't that often why we choose to lie? We don't want someone to think less of us, and so we bend the truth just a little bit. We don't want to hurt someone's feelings. And so we don't share what we actually think about something. We want us to think that we have this great impact. We're a person of influence and, and uh, consequence. And so we exaggerate. We make up stories. Maybe it's kind of like the mom who confronts her, her teen. Cecil, did you take that cookie I made those cookies for the youth adult party, and there's not enough for everyone but just to have one. Whoa. What's Cecil going to do? Let's say it's a student, and the teacher confronts the student and says, Candace, did you copy your paper off the internet because it looks awfully similar to the article I found in Wikipedia? Or maybe it's the doctor inquiring of her patient, Lewis, have you been cutting the sweets like you were supposed to? Because your numbers are still not where they need to be. <laughs> yeah, I got some of you. <laughs> now, for me, it's often with my kids looking for equity, and they say, Daddy, how many cookies have you eaten? <laughs> Two times three? <laughs> you know, we kind of justify these little lies in our minds, thinking it's not going to hurt anyone. And with Ananias and Sapphira, the church is getting a ton of money. Ananias and Sapphira are getting this recognition. What's the big deal? Well, to God, it's a big, big deal. It's so egregious that Ananias doesn't even have the opportunity to repent. 
he is confronted and dead in the same sentence. Why? Why is God so severely punishing Ananias for this deception? You know, I think when we kind of make our own judgments on these things, we're really quick to forget whom we're dealing with. And Peter calls it out very clearly. He says, Ananias, you have not lied to men, but you have lied to God. God is not deceived. I mean, he was there when the sale took place. He saw, he knows the amounts. And God doesn't accept our lies. But how often do we try to lie to God? God, you're first in my life, but I want to... God, I'll serve you. I just don't want to do... God, I know I need to overcome this sin, but... God, I trust you with everything, but I just can't afford to. What's the excuses that we use? Because God is not deceived by those excuses or our failed priorities or our lack of faith. And with these little caveats and compromises, they're such a big deal because we view God so small. And we look at people and our circumstances and our problems, and they're, they're huge and gigantic and really too big. We cover up because we're afraid of what others might think or say, and we're not concerned enough about what God thinks or says. And our failings hurt the church, God's people, and destroy our unity, the people that Jesus bled and died for. The root of our our issue here in the passage is integrity. When no one else knows, will we be consistent with the standards that we've set? And see, it's really kind of our standards because Ananias and Sapphira here, this wasn't God's expectation. God wasn't necessarily telling them or demanding this gift from them. This was a free gift from Ananias and Sapphira. But then they lied. And God takes that hypocrisy super seriously because we can't say that we're a Christian and then just live however we want. We have to be consistent with words and deeds because our lives reflect the reputation of our God. And God will defend his reputation, particularly when God is establishing his expectations of something new. And the church here was something new. And it could have easily kind of excused Ananias and Sapphira's behavior and just said, hey, look at the benefit. This is a really big gift. This is going to really help out for all those widows that we have. But God's expectation was different. Small lies, little deceptions, they're forbidden because it reflects poorly on the God that we represent. If we're honest, when we consider what the church has done, like not our church, but churches generally, the church has not been good at this. Think of churches who kind of bend the rules for that special donor who gives a ton of money. Or maybe it's the the pastor or the priest who does this amazing ministry and people are coming to Jesus like crazy, but there's a lot of indiscretions that are being covered up. That is unacceptable. It's not the way of God. It's not the way of his people. We must be consistent with this message that belongs to our God. Uh, Jordan Peterson, he's a conservative psychologist and commentator on like social and political issues. And he's spoken a lot about the Old Testament, particularly from like a psychological perspective. And he's never made a profession of faith, though as I listen to some of the things he says, it sounds like he believes in God, but when he's asked about it, he gives this like expression of overwhelming fear. And he says, who dares claim to know God? I'm terrified of the thought of living consistent to that ideal, so I dare not claim it. You hear what he's saying there? Jordan is saying he understands that a claim that God exists means that my life must be consistent. And so my life must reflect this honor to God and and giving him the praise that he deserves. And to declare that there's a God requires a life that is consistent to the claim. 
God takes our lies and our hypocrisy and our failures to fight for obedience very seriously. And personally, I would argue that the number one reason people deny God is because they've had dealings with Christians who look nothing like Jesus. And maybe their parents dragged them to church, but their parents weren't faithful. Or their friends claimed to to know about God, but every weekend they were partying and getting wasted and drunk. Or maybe they knew a pastor that was just simply a jerk. You know, we all screw up, but we can't have idols. We can't have other gods that are competing for our love for our God without destroying the reputation of the one who died and bled for us. And people's souls are at stake. And they're looking at us. I wish they wouldn't. I wish they would just look at Jesus because he's perfect. But they're looking at our lives. And they're making these calculations and trying to figure out, is faith worth it? Is it worth to give up my life to pursue God? And if our lives are contrary to the Lord, it'd be better if we didn't claim his name at all. God takes his reputation very seriously, and he wants his people to take his name seriously. Now, some of you skeptics out there might be like, well, wait a second. Ananias, he didn't necessarily die because God, like, struck him down. Maybe he just had a heart attack, and it was a stressful situation. And so maybe it was an aneurysm or something along those lines. Well, let's see. Let's keep reading in our passage, see if it gives some clarity for us. Follow along with me in verse 7. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got paid for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Well, this passage shows us a couple things. One, this wasn't just a fluke, because it's not like Ananias and Sapphira would both have these like natural heart incidences and just fall dead precisely when Peter's confronting them. God here is declaring that his people must be holy. His people must follow him or expect his discipline. And you can't like really pass the blame onto other people if say you're an accomplice, uh, because accomplices typically say when they get caught, hey, I didn't do it, it wasn't me, which is technically correct. But it doesn't seem like God makes a distinction here and he doesn't seem to care about that technicality. God cares about a person's heart. So is there something in your life that you need to confess? Don't wait until you're confronted about it. It didn't turn out too well for Ananias and Sapphira. And so let's confess that now and let's work together as we fight for unity with one another to follow Jesus better. If it's something you're not aware of, that's a little bit different. But if it's something that you're trying to avoid addressing, something that maybe even you're hiding, Let's confess that and deal with it. And let's seek this consistency in our testimony of faith and the life that we're living. And this is not easy. This is going to require some painful conversations sometimes. It's going to require people speaking the hard truth in our lives. But for the sake of our Lord and those that need to know him, let's crucify our pride and use every opportunity to consistently proclaim Jesus. And so God's wrath on Ananias and Sapphira had a a really interesting impact on the community at large. Let's look at that starting in verse 12. Verse 12, it says, The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared to join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more... And more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. 
Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. Now, people were afraid, but more people came to know Jesus and to trust him. And that kind of makes sense um, if you associate with Christians and you might think, man, if I don't have my life completely like straightened out and I'm not measuring up, I'm dead. That's a good reason to be a little bit afraid. And they probably felt this pressure that if you accept God, then you need to image God. And we want people to look at us and catch a glimpse of who our God is. It's an incredible honor. It's a responsibility that should weigh on us a little bit to wear the name of Jesus. But there is good news. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to pursue. It's kind of like in any relationship. No one expects their loved ones to be perfect. And if you do, you're probably the problem. (laughs) But when you screw up, you should own that and go to the person and say, hey, I did this, I want to make things right. Because, you know, when you're honest and you're authentic, it's actually a greater testimony than being perfect. It's much easier to relate to people and forgive them when they're genuine and they're honest. Maybe you have a serious struggle this morning. Confess it. Let us, your fellow followers, come alongside and help you. Look, we all have issues that we have to deal with. We want to help each other along in this. We want everyone to succeed in faith because it shows the power of our God. We have a vested interest in people pursuing God with us. It's part of our unity. This is also true in kind of the reciprocal. When someone does something wrong, we need to speak up, even if it's going to cost us. Because we believe that the God of the universe guards his reputation. And he says he is for us, and so who can be against us? You know, and the nations and kings plot in vain, but we serve the almighty God. And we're not actually fighting a battle because our God has already won the war through what Jesus has done on the cross. And so we just have the special privilege to continue this mission that God has given to us to, pro- or to, to gather people into his kingdom and rescue them from the gates of hell. Until the Lord says, enough. And so we should be bold. We should speak the truth. And not like a jerk, not trying to one-up other people, but with compassion, with grace, with love, showing the freedom that there is in Jesus. And I think that's why the first Christians commanded such a high regard. You know, the fathers of our faith weren't perfect. Remember Peter? He denied our Lord but they worked hard at being faithful. And so is there an area in your faith walk that needs to be addressed, that needs some more authenticity? Is there a place where you're being inconsistent? Do you need to speak up about something that's wrong, but you're not sure what to say, you're afraid of what could happen? Man, I'd love to wrestle with you on that and try to figure out what it looks like in your context to speak the truth in love. Maybe we need to admit our failure to our kids and and just say, hey, I didn't live up to the standard that God set. Or maybe we need to bring a bad habit to light and confess an addiction or a secret sin. Let's not play around with this stuff. We're talking about the unity of God's people. And God desires a noble people, a people who are principled and compassionate who reflect him. I think when the church lives this out in the community, we're going to see the same effect that we see in our passage here, that more people believed, even though they're terrified, more people believed. And they looked at Christians for healing. Guys, we have the answers for some of those mental and some of those emotional disorders that are plaguing our community. But when they see the unity that we have, they're going to come to us for those answers. But we have to show them a different way of living. And it's going to cost us. We can't do whatever we want, but it is worth it. And it's a high standard. 
But see, people are drawn to a high standard, and they will even submit their lives to God because of the, exa- uh, the example of excellence that they see in a church that is unified following after Jesus. I think this is really big for Christians. And as we've been saying, this is the way. It's our God's expectation that his people be consistent with the message that we proclaim. And to achieve that here at Calvary, one of the things that we do that's really hard is we confront each other. And we don't confront each other like to make people feel horrible or to to shame them. We confront in order to remove sin because of sin's evil and its destruction in our group. We don't want sin to ruin our reputation, ruin our unity, ruin the reputation of our God in the community. We want our community to see God through us. And so we desire to be the images of God to our neighbors and to our friends and to our doctors and to our police officers, to our teachers. Can I speak with the young adults and college age teens real quick? You guys live in a really hard environment. And the reality is you're dealing with lies constantly and you have to push back. Now, I just think of like social media with all the filters and stuff. That's a form of lies. But there's much more than that. Don't join the crowd. Be honest. Don't lie because others want you to. There is right and there is wrong. And it isn't determined by a person's feelings. There are standards and rules that can't be overlooked by people trying to pursue their authentic selves. Be bold, be strong, and be clear. You don't need to be judgmental. You don't need to act like you're better than others because the reality is, if you're a believer and you have the spirit of the living God in you and you're still struggling with sin, you have a huge advantage over those who are trying to do what's good outside the world. So have compassion on them because you're struggling with the Holy Spirit. But we don't play the game. We don't have to use our friends' pronouns. You can still love. You can still be kind. You can hear their struggles. You can go with them in their hurts just like Jesus does for us and be Jesus to that person, but speak the truth kindly. And your honesty might be that breath of fresh air that others are looking for. I mean, seriously, who wants to relate to people who constantly tell them exactly what they want to hear? That's not a good relationship. So be strong and courageous, but be the real friend that speaks the truth in love. You don't have to look good to others. You already look good to God by trusting in Jesus. So Christian, we pursue this honesty and this authentic authenticity. Big <laughs> step that I want us to take this week. I want you to find someone who you can trust and let them ask you absolutely any question. Give them permission that they can ask you about anything in regards to your walk with Jesus Christ. Maybe they need to ask you about giving. Oh, that's a big one. But I think... Man, if we're serious about loving God, we need to be open. We need to be willing to hear from our trusted friends. Now, it doesn't mean you have to do everything they tell you. That's not what I'm saying here. But you need to receive feedback and hear what they have to say about your spiritual walk. Do you have someone who maybe can look at your calendar and just challenge you a little bit on how much time you're putting in with your your family? Are you prioritizing time with them? Are you prioritizing time in ministry? Guys, you have someone who can look over your searches on the internet and hold you accountable to what you're looking at. Are we going to be serious about being faithful? Because our relationships, they need to look different than what's normal. We're claiming a God that loves and sacrifices for us. And maybe you don't have a person that you can trust. Well, we have a way in which uh, we try to get people to know each other a little bit better, and it's called just a meal. And they're organizing a potluck and such in the next, next week. So that would be an excellent way to get started. It's really simple. It's just like the name says. It's just a meal. And you gather with a group of people, get to know them a little bit, and 
this is a way in which um, we're, we're trying to challenge each other in our faith. See, we want to press each other on towards loving good deeds so that when we stand before God, we're able to say, God, we pursued you with our whole hearts. We took the narrow road. We relied on, on you to help us pursue our relationship with you at a deeper level, and we let our, our fellow followers speak truth into our lives. Let's not hide our mess. We all have it. I have it. Let's deal with it. And let's pursue a purity in our faith. Now, if, if this really scares you, there might be something that you need to confess. And maybe for some of you, you need to take a deeper look at your priorities because you've only been kind of going through the motions. And you need to really hand your life over to God this morning. God alone has the answers to satisfy our hearts, and Jesus alone is the only way that we receive forgiveness from our feelings and from our sin. And so we need to turn away from all those other pursuits, all those other things that are in our lives, and pursue God. Acknowledge the futility of seeking satisfaction in anything other than the eternal and infinite almighty God whose love and grace and righteousness is available to us through the Spirit. But it all starts with calling on Jesus and asking him to forgive us and telling him we want him to be our Lord. And you can do that now. I beg you to do that now if you have never done that so that you can be transformed forever. And then join us in this high calling to represent the God of the universe because you've been revived. It's time for us to go reveal and be honest and truthful and faithful because this is the way. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the clear examples that you present before us. Lord, of how significant even the little lies are. Lord, in, in some ways, we get so used to the half-truths and the little deceptions. Lord, we forget about that we represent a holy and righteous God who is perfect in every way, who is not influenced by the perceptions and, Lord, the opinions of others, but speaks boldly truth. And so, Lord, we thank you for the example of Jesus who came to this world and, Lord, didn't shy away from saying difficult things and speaking truthful things, even to people in positions of power, even people that would condemn him to death. Lord, give us that boldness, that honesty with ourselves to see our hearts as you see them and to confess the things that are not aligned with who you are. Lord, we desire unity as a group. And so, Lord, if there is anything that's preventing that, would you point that out to us that we would address it? Lord, we want to pursue you. We want to be faithful to you. We want people to look at us and catch a glimpse of you so that they want to follow you. They want to give up their lives. They want to know Jesus. And so, Lord, bless those efforts. Lord, make us bold. And Lord, if there's anyone here who is not taking that first step of seeking forgiveness through Jesus and making the relationship right with you, I pray that the Spirit would just weigh upon them right now. To choose not to leave today, this morning, without committing themselves fully to you and crying out to you and asking for forgiveness. Lord, you've made it so simple for us. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for dying, for taking our sin upon the cross. So, Lord, I pray that you would be refining your church, refining our hearts, giving us the courage that we need to speak truth 
So Lord, there could be healing in our community. And so, Lord, we love you and we thank you and we ask that you would continue to work with us as we lift up your name and give you praise because you are a good, good God. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Yo 
great are you, Lord. One more. Oh, great are you, Lord. Our God is so good. He is so great. He is so worthy of our praise. If there's anyone who needs to just pray with someone at the end of the service, just come. I'll be up here. Some of our elders will be up here as well to pray with you. But let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. As you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word and deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. All God's people said, amen. Amen. Now, don't move. We have a special video that we have to see, so go ahead and sit down real quick. We've been trying to get this video to you for a little bit, but things haven't worked out too well, so we finally have it available to you, and this is our missionary. Um, Steve Wilkinson uh, with Converge, and he's just sharing an update with us. So let's go ahead and see that.